Welcome to the No Bullshit Debates with the City Council candidates of District 1. We are your moderators, Chris Ward. And I'm De La Vaca. We want to thank the candidates for first stepping out to represent their communities. We also want to thank Denver Open Media, KGNU Radio, the Open Media Foundation, and Civic Matters for hosting this event. But most importantly, we want to thank you, the audience, for participating in the democratic process. And here are the debate rules. The moderators will ask the candidates questions on the topic of civil rights and related issues. Responding candidates will have 1.5 minutes to answer, then two candidates will have the opportunity to rebut, after which the primary candidate will have the opportunity to reply for one minute. We will kindly interrupt if somebody goes too long, uh, but as we are on webinar, we have the power to mute any candidate that goes over time. This debate is slated for 55 minutes. As we draw into the last five to 10 minutes, we may push into the lightning round. At that time, candid candidates will be asked closed-ended questions and will answer in a concise fashion with either a yes or a no. All right, so let's first go out to the candidates in no specific order. Uh, we want to uh, ask the candidates to share their name, uh, their background, and why it is that they're running for city council. So at the top of my list, I've got Mr. Soma. Yes, sir. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, Mike Soma, uh, I'm a native of Denver, uh, born and raised in North Denver, have never left, and currently I'm a public servant for the last 34 years with the Denver Fire Department. And the reason I'm running is because my district wasn't represented well uh, with the issues that come forth. Thank you. Sabrina De Agosta. Hi there. Sorry, I didn't get my mute button off right away. Um, my name is Sabrina De Agosta. I'm a seventh generation Denverite, and I'm raising my children here in Northwest Denver just like my grandparents did 50 years ago. I have 20 years of experience in government policy and communications, and I'm running for city council because I believe we need a representative who's willing to ask hard questions, stand up for our community, and demand responsible and affordable growth, and who can also introduce solutions, build coalitions, and support and negotiate for the investments that we deserve in our neighborhood. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Amanda Sandoval. <clears throat> Hello. Thank you for having this um, first video debate conference ever. So my name is Amanda Sandoval. I, I was a town councilwoman, Judy Montero, and Rafael Espinosa. And I'm a lifelong resident of Northwest Denver, graduated from North High School, earned my degree at Metro. And my vision is one of reflective representation, creating an environment where the community is engaged in the decision-making process, utilizing my land use expertise to help with the development issues that Northwest Denver is creating currently facing and also preserving the, new, the unique character well, that Northwest Denver has and makes it very eclectic and what has drawn people here while also working on affordable housing and transit solutions. Thank you. Thank you. David Sabados. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm David Sabados, of course, also running for Council District 1. Uh, yeah, I'm proud of my background working in policy at the local, state, and federal levels. Um, and I think District 1 needs a uh, representative who can be working collaboratively with their colleagues and with the community. Um, I also want to apologize at the get-go. I'm currently running about 100 degree fever and here on a lot of day quills. So if I'm a little slow to answer on a few things, I apologize. But I'm very glad to be having a video debate uh, in this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Scott. Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Dura. I've been a resident of Northwest Denver for 13 years. I've established five businesses and 150 jobs in District 1. I am the first African American to be licensed um, in the country for cannabis. Social justice has been a part of my whole family's life since day one. I'm a United States Marine. I've owned small businesses my whole life since the age of 15 years old. I've also have over 12 years experience in construction and property management. And like I said, my family is very much involved. My mother being the first African American to um, run a halfway house in Massachusetts. And my brother is a probation officer in New, in New Jersey. So this is something I'm uh, very passionate about. And I look forward to talking about it more. I'd love to be your city council for district one. Thank you. Thank you. And Prajwal Kulkarni could not be here tonight. Uh, so, we have, Victoria. we have one last person, Victoria Aguilar. Hi everybody, thank you for having us today. 
Um, my name is Victoria Aguilar. I was born and raised in this district, District 1. I was born to a working class family. And my father immigrated here uh, from Mexico, and my mother is a third generation Denver. Um, I am running for city council because for the past 10 years, I have served Denver's most marginalized populations at the Department of Human Services. I have seen the impact that our policies have on our community, and I believe that Denver is at a pivotal time in history where we need leaders who are able to put people first before profit, uh, people, uh, uh, leaders who are able to prioritize community over everything, and that's why I'm running for office. Well, thank you. All right, so we're going to go ahead with uh, the first topic is going to be on homelessness. And so just to remind the candidates that each person will get a minute and a half for an answer. If any other candidate wishes to rebut that, uh, comp uh, that answer, you'll get one minute and then the uh, candidate will also have another minute to uh, respond. So uh, the question being, Denver is currently debating and will be voting on Initiative 300, an initiative to allow any individual to engage in activities such as resting and sheltering oneself in a non-obstructive manner in an outdoor public place. The Right to Survive initiative is premised on protecting the homeless from city-mandated property seizures and camping bans that leave officers confiscating sleeping bags from unhoused people in all kinds of weather conditions. This is a city-authorized police action with, which both leaves the unhoused facing any number of adverse health outcomes, including and up to death, and which also deprives them of personal property. Do you support 300 and which other areas of our city resource should be mobilized to support our unhoused populations? Let's start with you, Mike. Yes or no? Yes. And this you can give a full explanation of your answer. We haven't got to the lightning round yet. Okay, who are you with? Mike. Mike. Oh, sorry, I missed there. That's okay. Uh, no on 300. Uh, I deal with this day in and day out as a Denver firefighter. Uh, this is just a band-aid to a severe cut wound. I believe that the city and county of Denver could do better to take care of the homeless. Homeless people are also Denverites too. And with that being said, I have a plan that will make us just like San Antonio. That's gonna be our pattern city of San Antonio is uh, 22 acres and it's one-stop shopping that uh, everything will be there. You go there, there will be food, showers, there will be counselors to help if you have addictions, there will be counselors to help you get back into the workforce and everything else that needs to be put you back into the living conditions of a Denverite. The, the San Antonio solution sounds like uh, a long-term project, and I think the Right to Survive initiative is a solution to help unhoused folks right now. Are there any other candidates that would like to rebut uh, Michael Soma's statement? I will. Go ahead, Sabrina. Okay, I just, um, Mike, if you're um, pointing to the San Antonio model as being the kind of model you'd like to see here in Denver. I'm just sort of curious how much you know about the re-entry back into sort of um, productive life for folks that have gone through that facility. I know here in, in Colorado, um, the Hickenlooper Labor Administration did a lot of work around creating a similar facility at Fort Logan. And one of the struggles that we've had here is around how our homeless population, when um, going to services like that in one-stop location, how you get them back into the community and integrated into the community and it's sort of the re-entry process okay sabrina that was a, a that's a good question and what we we have numerous uh catholic charities and all this and what i'm looking to do is bring everything to one one place so with that being said right now if i'm homeless and i have to go and do a test and I don't have transportation, how do I get there? So the re-entry, what we're gonna do is everything will be there and we'll have counselors and I will keep that counselor with that person and, and step them each way through each step of the way to help them get back on their feet. 
So instead of just a helping hand, we're going to take that whole person and make them feel the need to be back in society, to be a person, to show them that they could do it. They've done it before and to show them that they could do it again. Now, how that's going to line up, we're going to have to get, this is going to be a private and public interaction with everyone. So what I'm trying to do is instead of the shelter downtown uh, being in one place and Catholic Charities in another one and go over here for uh, your uh, health benefits and go over here for clothing and going over here for shelters, let's bring it all together in one area and make this their community and, and base them out that way is my thoughts. And this is work in, in progress. Thank you, Mike. And uh, go on to Sabrina. It's your turn to answer that question. Do you support 300? Um, no, I don't. I have um, volunteered serving people experiencing homelessness my whole life, um, working with Food Not Bombs. I worked at the Academy of Urban Learning on the board there for eight years serving homeless youth, um, and also with Denver's Road Home when I was in the mayor's office. Uh, I do believe that housing is a human right. Um, and I am hugely opposed to the urban camping ban that our city council and, and Mayor Hancock passed. I uh, believe that it's inhumane to tell people they can't cover themselves with blankets when they're cold or that they can't uh, sleep on the streets without fear of being incarcerated. Um, so if I was elected, I would work to overturn that immediately. Um, however, I, I think 300 is also not a solution to homelessness. And I think I fear that it makes situations more unsafe for people experiencing homelessness as well as the public and our businesses. Um, I also think it gives the administration cover to not fix the problem. And what we really need to be seeing is a housing first approach um, that we create transitional housing with access to services, um, reform the shelter system so it's a place that um, can get people into those services as opposed to the fear people have going to shelters now. Um, and I also think that we really need to work a lot harder on prevention. I think we can do more to protect our renters. We can increase the minimum wage. Ensuring our housing stock matches incomes. We have 20,000 vacant luxury apartments in Denver right now. That could house the entire homeless population of our state today. Thank you. Any rebuttal for Sabrina? All right. Let's move on to question number two. This question will be for Amanda Sandoval. Racial equality and equity remain a nationwide concern. Colorado had the most extensive KKK network west of the Mississippi East through the 1930s. Those people's children are still alive. The grandson of one ran for governor this past year. Educational equity has failed children of color based on zip code. Gentrification continues to be the process of wealthier, whiter people displacing communities of color and a city government more invested in development dollars for luxury and upscale housing than low and mid-income housing. The Colorado Trust tied historic segregation to modern gentrification. Addressing the racial, we uh, I'm sorry, the racial wealth gap in Colorado, they said, quote, the latest view uh, uh, of racial and income inequality in the U.S. shows deep and entrenched disparities along racial lines. How does it play out in Colorado? Not well. Across a range of measures, Colorado was failing to provide equitable opportunities across racial lines, end quote. Colorado recently made international news for the harassment of a black man cleaning his yard with officers claiming his trash grabber was a weapon. And Colorado is third in the nation for white supremacist propaganda. Yet, people of color suffer the brunt of policing. What are your thoughts on racial equality and equity and how will you work to move District 1 and, by extension, Colorado towards a more equal and equitable <laughs> racial future? Yeah, so thank you. you. That's a really tough question that you hit on a lot of points. So first of all, we have a new police commander named Paul Pazin, who was born and raised in North Denver, and he was a police commander. And if you look at Council District 1 and the policing that went on within Council District 1 while he was the police commander, you saw more equitable um, policing in North West Denver in regards to the police department. So it was more reflective of the, of the people who they were policing. So some of those things cannot just be taught institutionally or cannot be fixed with an institution such as city council. You have to start with schools. You have to work with schools. You have to educate at the school level. And you also have to have cultural education. So in Northwest Denver does not have cultural districts along, north, along um, Navajo Street, we had 
a lot of Italians community in North Denver. My family's owned La Casita in Northwest Denver since 1975, which serves tamales and a hub where people come to stop and find out local information. So at a city council, you have to have reflective government. So in, I've been working in city council office for six and a half years. So I knew the people who were, you have to build trust. So when people were having issues in Northwest Denver, we had that happen. We had signs that said, people go home. And we started, we are North Denver. And Bobby LaFreeway started a whole entire movement and a whole entire video series called We Are North Denver and the North Side. And it was, it played at Su Teatro. It, it was an online forum. And we helped him get information to produce, to make sure he was, he understood and had backing from the city council office to understand what was going on. So I have children. I cannot perpetuate that behavior. My children cannot perpetuate that behavior. And you have to have that in a leader who's willing to, when you have those flyers in your neighborhood, willing to stand up and meet the people out there with them and say, this will not be tolerated in Northwest Denver. Appreciate your response, Amanda. Does anybody want to rebut? <clears throat> Any of sure, our, uh, I will, Sabrina. Sabrina, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify because Amanda said um, something about that she doesn't feel like um, an institution like city council can really uh, impact change on, on this front. And I just want to disagree and say that um, I think our city council has a huge responsibility in these types of issues. Um, you know, uh, racial inequality affects us in so many different ways. Um, there's wage theft and misclassification of employees that impacts mostly uh, poor people of color and mostly immigrants. We can do something about that. Um, we can do a lot from an environmental standpoint to make sure that the neighborhoods where we have the largest percentage of people of color and low income um, aren't, aren't having a lower life expectancy um, in Denver. We can do more uh, through investments in infrastructure like housing, transit, and the availability of food. Um, we can help work with partners on things like equity um, in uh, equitable access to education um, and the quality of our schools. Um, you know, healthcare, services, transportation, those are all things that the city council can uh, impact. And I think that we have a responsibility to do so. Amanda, your response? Yes, yeah, so it takes a coalition and council members to get that done. Unfortunately, when you are in city council, you do not get to set the budget you are reacting to what the mayor gives you. And so, yeah, if you can go into city council and you can get six votes, plus yourself, plus seven to get things done, to build a coalition of council members, absolutely, you can have more of a progressive agenda. But currently right now, that city council does not exist because unlike what Sabrina said, it's not this current city council from 2015 to now that passed the camp camping ban. It was the previous council that passed the camping ban before. It passed in 2012 under Judy Montero and under other council members. And so you have to build a coalition of council members that are very progressive. And that's very challenging to do when people are taking one part of the pie. So once again, I didn't say that you have it. city council can't fix it. It's just not one stop shop because it, it has to come from all kinds of different agencies and all kinds of people working together and it has to come from the people. And once you empower the people, then the people feel like their representative can get what they've done. But yes, you can't come into city council as one city council member and think that suddenly you're going to be able to fix everything because every single vote that goes forward, you need six other council members. And if the mayor doesn't like it, then you need nine plus yourself so that it doesn't have a veto on it. And so I'm realistic about what a, one city council person can do within their neighborhood. And they can give funding from their city council budget to things like We Are North Denver. They can show up to productions like We Are North Denver. They can make sure that they have actors to make sure that they're having that uh, um, information really easily accessible. And then you can have you, but you can touch point on all of those things. But city council, you enter into a body and you need to be collaborative and you need to make sure that as you're talking, you need to talk 
to people like Elvis Brooks, who has the worst camping in the area. Why is this not fixed? How is this not, how is some of the main issues we have in Denver not fixed? It's because we do not have a progressive body of council members voting consistently time and time again against the mayor. And that is and what Amanda, needs to Amanda, change, what I will bring. Can I interject? I mean, I'm the only person here of color, and I think this is very important for me to inject. Scott, thank you for your um, rebuttal. Please do. Well, the only person of color? You're, there's three Latinas on this phone. Thank you. I would appreciate different different I've experienced, it's, Amanda, you had your chance, please. Now it's my chance, please. I've had, I've had, ex, I've experienced police harassment in this district almost a year ago. My wife and I filed a police report. This is not something that city council needs to do with a whole. It's something as an individual should do. As, as a city council member for this city, I will have a direct line for anyone in my district who has a situation with the police that I will handle that directly and, 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 and make it a priority. This is a priority. Colorado does not have a large percentage of people of color being black, but yet we are still arrested at a higher rate than anyone else. I was the first African American licensed in the dispensary industry to fight social justice because we've seen it. We've seen that black and brown people get arrested more than once. So it's not a matter of city council standing together as a whole, because that might not happen. It's as taking the responsibility as an individual and making sure that you will fight for everyone in your district that does not look like you. I will be at that police station, make sure that that doesn't happen. That is called influence. And one of the things we have to be careful of here is there's very few things that we can do without the majority of city council. But one of the things we have to focus on your influence. Who have you influenced? I've been influenced the cannabis business and fighting for social justice nationally since 2010. And I'm not elected official and I have impact. So it goes back to the individual and the character. And once again, I ask everyone on this council or everyone who's running for this seat here, and I ask you, have you experienced police harassment? Have you been arrested? Have you experienced what most people in this state have not experienced? I have, I understand how it hurts, it affects families, and that's why we need a city council member who's going to stand up regardless of what city council says. So what I'm hearing from you, Amanda, if city council says, no, we're not going to fight this, you're just going to say, okay, and go back to your office. I won't. I will be at that police department that morning to make sure that the person who was harassed or who was felt that they were not properly, let's say, addressed, I will fight for them. And that's what we need as a city council member. Thank not you for your someone comments, who's just going Scott. to play for the end, Scott, I really appreciate your comments. To be clear, I think Amanda was talking about community action uh, and the concern that council wouldn't be as effective as a body, uh, which Sabrina rebutted and said that we can uh, do a lot of things from council. But Amanda, that was a rebuttal to your uh, uh, opening statement on this question. Do you have a response, a one minute reply to Scott? Yeah, so I just wanna make sure that we're all clear that I think there's a lot of like people of color on this panel. So I wouldn't start to judge anybody else. I think when you point fingers and you start calling, making statements like that as a leader, you are disenfranchising other people and you're not made inclusive of anyone else. So that's the type of leadership that we don't need. The type of leadership that we need is thoughtful. It's to be respectful. It's to be respectful of everyone, regardless of their color of their skin or where they come from or what they do or what their background is, how much money they make, if they're the, the most poor people on the back in, on, in Denver. Some of the most successful conversations I had as a waitress in my family's restaurant in Northwest Denver since the time I was a little girl were with the homeless people who were behind the dumpster. We would feed them tamales to make sure that we understood what was going on in North Denver. They were helping us keep track of our neighborhood. They would tell us who was doing graffiti. So no, I was not saying anything that I would not go help anybody. I'm just much more empathetic and a compassionate person where I will bring people in with me. I will hear what their needs are and I will meet them where they are. So thank you. Thank you. Let's go on to question number three. Uh, David Sabatos, we're going to bring this to you on the topic of sexual harassment and uh, domestic violence. So April is sexual harassment or a sexual assault awareness month. 
According to the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, nearly one in five women and one in 71 men in the United States have been raped at some time in their lives. 42% of victims experienced their first completed rape before the age of 18. In Colorado, the lifetime prevalence of sexual violence by any perpetrator for women is 23.8%. The national prevalence is 18.3%. The current Violence Against Women Act in Congress closes the boyfriend loophole. Uh, extending existing gun restrictions to include current and former dating partners convicted of abuse or stalking charges. A 2016 survey found that 28% of CU Boulder's female undergrads had been sexually assaulted. CU is in the news now for a recent rape. Denver's BA, uh, DA Beth McCann was found in 2018 to have prosecuted 33% of rape cases, small improvement over her predecessor's average of 30%. The Denver Post's rape tracker shows that Denver has a, uh, 122 rapes so far this year, an average of 38.2 per month. Uh, that's almost 1.3 per day. Uh, the most rapes any neighborhood in Denver has had this year is five points with nine. The average number of rapes per neighborhood this year is 1.56. David, how will you using your seat on the council address these issues and make Colorado a safer place uh, for women and men and, uh, and female identified bodies? No, thank you. Um, this is an incredibly important question. And, you know, you uh, cited a statistic of 122, uh, you know, rapes. And I think we can all recognize that tragically that number is actually much higher, as I'm sure that's a reported number um, and you know always goes as one of the most unreported uh, crimes certainly uh, first uh, I think it starts with uh, making sure that our first responders have the training that they need uh, to recognize uh, when there's someone uh, who needs help you know often a first responder is called and there's not um, the sort of uh, understanding of what a situation is in a domestic case um, that they may not be aware of abuse going on in a household when they think there's something else. Um, one of the other things, uh, you know, specifically of what city government needs to do is make sure that we put our own house in order, to be clear. Um, you know, just, I believe it was last week, there was a case of a lieutenant in the fire department uh, recording uh, a coworker without her consent. Um, I mean, that sort of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, violence against other uh, city employees um, is absolutely um, not acceptable as well. And, um, you know, I think we need to make sure that um, those same first responders we're talking about, um, that we get our house in order there. Thank you. Does anybody have a rebuttal? Going once. Going twice. Would anybody like to concur with David? Yeah, I will. <laughs> Sabrina again. Please. Yeah, I just, I think I, I want to call out and, and, and underscore the importance of what David just said about uh, some of the things that are happening in our city departments. Um, with last week in, in the fire department, the fire department has had other cases um, that, that have uh, involved harassment of female workers there. Um, and, I, you know, I think that we need to take a look at how we're, we're handling those things in the city. Um, I also just want to say that I think, you know, it's, it's I, I want to point out the Start by Believing campaign and encourage you all to take a look at that and take their pledge um, that they have available on their website. That the reality is most victims of uh, sexual and domestic violence never report it um, because they're afraid. And one of the things that's really important for us to do is create trusting relationships with our um, law enforcement and emergency responders so that people feel like they can report um, these crimes and they shouldn't have to worry about immigration status, language barriers, fear of arrest or police brutality while these things are going on. Um, and I think that we also need to extend this to include sexual harassment um, because to me, our attitudes start there as a society. Um, if we allow for people in the workplace to harass their coworkers and in many cases cover it up, that if we're allowing for our elected officials to harass city employees and we're using public funds to defend them behind closed doors, that's a problem. We're further shaming our victims. And when we shame victims, they don't come forward, others don't come forward, whether that's harassment or sexual or physical abuse at home or in the workplace. Um, our country's tired of it. Women are tired of it. We stand united and thanks to the Me Too movement, 
Um, I really think we need to put an end to using taxpayer dollars to defend any city employee or elected official from sexual harassment allegations or for hush money to keep victims silent. Um, and would like to see a whole lot more done in the fire department. Um, Mike, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. You said something at our Channel 8 debate that worried me in terms of uh, your response to how to make the fire department being more um, uh, safe for a safer place for women employees was that, um, you know, it's a tough physical job and that women uh, who want to go into firefighting really need additional training so that they can understand what they're getting into is what you said. And that kind of attitude really concerns me because I think what we need is more training for our male firefighters to be more sensitive to those exact um, types of attitudes. I believe candidate Soma was uh, mentioned by name there. Did you want a response, sir? So I don't think Mike Soma is on the line anymore. I don't see him on my, my screen. You lost. But I can. I work for the Denver Fire Department. And so right now, this is impacting me directly. I'm not a uniform firefighter. I'm a civilian who works in the fire department. And so this issue has come forward several times. Um, because there was a lawsuit, a federal lawsuit, and now this lawsuit with the video. And so I think it stems from what both candidates said, that we have to start from the top down. So when we don't have top down, and we're not holding people accountable right away, yeah, then that's thing? a serious problem. Because when you have women who are working in the fire department and who are working hard, I... I my direct report is to the only women division chief. And I don't think even people know that we have a woman as a division chief in the city and county of Denver. And I'm proud to work for Windy Motor. And every day we go to work, we talk about the sensitivity that needs to be done and the sensitivity training. And, the, and so what we do is we do have a peer support system. And so the fire department started the peer support system, and now they're actually going to Washington DC to re receive a award for the peer support system. And I will just say for that woman who had the issue with the camera, thank goodness that we had a lieutenant or, or a division chief who was a woman who could go to that station and who could help her and who could talk her through this. And that's what reflective representation is all about. So we need to make sure that with all of the issues that do come up within, for example, the fire department, we are also talking about how we are promoting within the fire department and we are promoting the women in the fire department and that we do have a division chief at the fire department who directly went to that woman to give her the support she needed. But I think David and Sabrina make a very good point. The only thing that I would add is that we have the Rose Andam Center. And so when you're a victim, my sister was a victim it impacts the entire family. It doesn't just impact the victim. I was 10 years old and I remember having to go speak to a counselor because of what happened to my sister. And I remember being afraid when we got home. I remember having to call the police department to have extra patrol in our neighborhoods because of what happened. So the Rose Andam Center, we need to make sure that we're opening it and we're providing funding for it and that we're providing that's about to meet the victims where they are instead of the victims having to come leave the comfort of their home and come down to the victim center, the Rose Andam Center that was just recently opened for victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. <clears throat> Thank you. If I could add to that. I'm sorry. I think also, and I think um, everyone has brought up a good point. I think we really need to do as well and get hiring more women and um, in some of the positions overseeing some of these organizations, whether it's the police department, the fire department, or even in city hall. I think once again, if we have more diversity from the top, understanding what a lot of the problems are, then I get we can under have a better understanding of what those solutions are. I would also like to see at some point, like I said, I think I, need, I think we need to go to the, um, back to our colleges, back to our schools. So this training in terms of sexual harassment is now happening with our children. You know, once we get to a certain age, we all know we have, we have bad habits and we, we, we over the years, um, those things get worse. But if we start with our children, um, I think that's going to be one of our biggest challenges and making sure that we do have more women and people of color in higher positions. And then that way, I, I think it's gonna help us find a solution to um, the items that we're talking about today. Scott, that's a great point. Uh, and it, it echoes uh, what was said by David earlier about getting our own house in order. 
One thing that stands Hello, out to this is Mike so much. Can you guys hear me? We Mike, got you, sir. Mike, we can. I'm going to come, come back to you in one second okay. because they definitely mentioned you in the debate. But let me make okay. this one point. The conversation around getting our house in order and making sure that we're teaching uh, consent and all this in our schools uh, is actually happening in our state house right now. Uh, the issue is highly divisive. Uh, people on the right uh, against teaching consent in our sex ed. Sex ed isn't even required in our schools, which is to say, uh, if this passes, which it probably will under the current Democratic administration, there's a good chance that consent will be required in schools where sex ed is taught, but not all schools teach it. So uh, how do we address that? But to bring it back to, uh, to Mike, Mike, sir, you were brought up in the conversation about uh, a response that you had towards sexual harassment inside the firehouse about uh, a comment that you made that it's a tough job and women should have extra training to do it. Um, and I just wanted to get your response to that. Well, yeah, I'm trying to get in and I keep having a technical difficulty here. Can you hear me now? We can hear you fine, sir. Okay, thanks. So uh, to answer Sabrina's question, Sabrina, I didn't have a lot of information on that last thing. And I think uh, traditionally the, the fire department has always been a, a male thing. Over the years, we're doing better than any other department right now at a 5% with females enrollment in our program. But I did a little research since my conversation last time, and the fire department has come a long way, but yet there are still uh, people that do not recognize the female in their fire departments. Uh, what I think we need to do is when we do training and go out and do recruiting, we have to have females go out do recruiting and go with that uh, to go down that way. To speak with about the fire department with the lieutenant last week, that lieutenant was taken off of line immediately and our administration did a fabulous job by taking care of that person, not only the, pe the perpetrator, but also the person that was a victim. And that was a male officer that led her down the right path and took care of her. So we are a family in the Denver Fire Department. Excellent. David, that was your question, so I'll go back to you to respond. I'm sorry, I don't believe that was. Uh, I think he was responding to Sabrina. Yeah, absolutely. Did you have anything else uh, to comment on? Uh, no. I no, right now. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. You want to go ahead and question four? Question four will be for Scott. Scott. Scott, sir. Uh, this, this topic is community wellness. According to DenverPublicHealth.org, uh, City Council District Report for District 1, life expectancy is lower than average at 77.4 years compared to 78.6 across the region. Uh, differences in life expectancy between districts show that place matters. 20% uh, of 18 to 24 year olds consume tobacco, which is 3% higher than their peers regionally. 15% of public school students aged 2 through 17 are dealing with obesity in District 1. Uh, the report mentions that uh, obesity is a common and preventable condition, often related to unhealthy eating and physical inactivity, but fails to mention poverty of community, oftentimes uh, preventing access to those sorts of things. 11% of residents have been diagnosed with depression. Uh, and in fact, one in every four of our District 1 community members is living with some kind of mental health issue. Denver.gov clearly states that the health of a community depends on more than access to health care. Healthy communities are composed of our physical environment, healthy opportunities, support, and where individuals easily connect with community partners, healthy food systems, and safe environments. Increased access to these items allows individuals of a healthy community to thrive. Now, do you believe District 1 is serving its community equitably in these areas? And if not, what will you do to address disparities in the district? I lost a point you said the last seconds, so I'll do my best. Um, I think we do have a responsibility in our community to make sure that our, that our residents are healthy. And I think a lot of that does come with building communities, you know, addressing certain issues, uh, working with our school department, et cetera, the way our children are eating, the way our children are exercising, sports programs. I think those are some of the things that are really going to um, help our youth with obesity 
and health issues. I think in terms of a community, I think I think we can have more public gardens. I think we can utilize this, these create those public gardens, which would then can bring um, alternative food sources to our communities. But more importantly, it um, of how to be healthier. We can connect with more private organizations communities for health reasons. Uh, mental health is a whether it is with our seniors, whether it is with our kids, whether it is with people in our district, and especially our veterans. We have to dive more into what we're connecting those resources with public, but also with private organizations who are willing to step in and help us out. So I think as a community, what we have to do is we have to understand what the needs of our communities more, looking for other resources to come in on top of what the city can offer. We understand that we're challenged in terms of what the city can do, but that's once again is understanding your community and the needs of your community is stepping outside of the box and looking for those other private organizations and public services and health uh, and, and health services are going to come in and address a lot of that. But I think a lot of it as well starts at home and it's really teaching um, our parents and, and, and how to take care of ourselves a lot better. And that becomes of education. So there are a lot of options with education, whether it's social media or other programs, I think that we can provide more information to our communities so we can address it together. And as city council member, that would be one of my concerns, making sure that we can address it as a whole. Thank you, sir. Uh, did anybody have a rebuttal or concurrence? I have a concurrence. This is Victoria. Uh, as many of you know, access to mental and behavioral health is part of my platform and has been part of my platform, has been part of the work that I've served our community in for the past 10 years. I think when we talk about public health, we also need to talk about the systems of oppression that are in our city that are alive and well. Uh, we need culturally responsive programs uh, to address these public health issues um, in our district. I think that um, when we have a healthy individual, we build healthy families, then we build healthy neighborhoods and build healthy cities. I believe that a leader in city council should definitely uh, have some experience working with our population. Uh, just like you mentioned, one in four of every community member is battling with some type of mental illness. And that, uh, that statistic transcends through race, through culture, um, through social class. And so I think that our programs are severely underfunded statewide, but also particularly in Denver. There are initiatives at the Capitol um, and 70% of voters voted uh, for the Caring for Denver. So I think that we as a community know that there's a crisis and we need leaders who are going to address that and make that a priority. Um, yeah. Victoria, looking at the uh, candidates' websites, you were definitely the only one that we saw that had listed mental and behavioral health specifically uh, right. as an issue priority. Uh, so thank you for that. Did any other candidate have a uh, rebuttal or concurrence to Scott? Scott. I would say that one of the things, because Denver, because City Council District 1 is so close to Suncor, and that's the refinery right in Globeville that actually, if you are in certain parts of Council District 1, say for instance at Zunai Park on 52nd and Zunai, where my aunt and uncle live, you can literally smell the refinery from, De from North Denver. And as a person who has asthma, you can feel the impacts when Suncor and other parts of Commerce City. So we need to talk about holistically and when you're planning, what we did in Global Area in Swansea was we created this um, health impact assessment. And so we took an impact assessment of the neighborhoods before we did any planning initiatives, before the Globeville plan and before the um, Swansea Illyria plan were adopted. We worked with Promodoras and other nonprofits and then environmental health to actually see where um, where were we lacking health, where were we lacking food, where were we lacking other major conditions that were playing so playing an impact on health and mental wellness so when you did planning and the planning process happened you could have a more in-depth knowledge of what was going on but first and foremost we have to deal with suncor and we have to take a stance against commerce city as a as a city city of denver all of city council the mayor we have to hold suncor 
accountable because we are the most impacted besides council district nine depending on which way that this the um the wind blows i can smell it from my house i can hear i-70 so we really need to talk about these issues and we need to hold other um, counties accountable if we are going to make impacts within our own yeah i just i just want a second i just want a second can i speak Sorry. Right, so, go ahead victoria sabrina Thank you. Oh, I, I just wanted to second what Amanda just said about Suncor because it is, um, it's not just the mental and beha behavioral health services that impact our quality of life. We need to also be holistically thinking about our environment and the built environment that we're creating as well. Um, and I do think that it's important to note that, you know, we, we need to bring those resources to people. People do not have access to grocery stores, healthcare, transportation, um, access to those mental and behavioral health services, um, parks and recreational opportunities. And so, you know, um, Colorado spends about a billion dollars a year on mental and behavioral health crisis in the reactive stage um, through our psychiatric hospitals and prisons and hospital emergency rooms. And we really need to have a paradigm shift where we start becoming more proactive in treating people preventively on the front end and getting people to those services so that we can change that. Um, I think we can create culturally responsive programs and accessible therapy and wraparound support services that people can actually access through transportation that are available and affordable and that we can improve people's lives that way. Sabrina, you're absolutely correct. Uh, and I'm actually really glad to see so many of our candidates concur with this idea that we need to hold our elected officials accountable and do better for our communities. Suncor is one part of a larger problem. And I think SB 181 is giving city, uh, cities the tools they need to fight back, uh, and and should you all be in that position to fight back on behalf of your city, uh, I think that we'll have some good folks to do it. We have one more question before we move into the lightning round. Mind. I think there's a couple things on you know on healthcare access uh, and Slancor. First of all, I mean the idea that we need to be uh, holding another county accountable, I think was a term just used. Like yes, at the same time, we actually need to look realistically of what we need to be doing um, intergovernmentally. Denver and Adams County are probably best at suing each other more than working collaboratively over the years. And that's yielded absolutely no positive uh, results for either one of our communities. Um, having someone who can actually work collaboratively between the Denver City Council and the Adams County Commissioner is important. It's why I, I'm proud to um, have support from uh, folks in Adams County uh, as well in elected office um, who have said yes, if we actually have people in Denver who want to work collaboratively, we'll do that. Um, I may also be the only candidate here who's actually fought for universal uh, health care access in the past. You know, I was proud to stand with uh, Dr. Irene Aguilar um, uh, and others, uh, you know, on those efforts in the past. And so I think it's important to look, you know, what we've done in the past as well, not just uh, what we're going to do in the future. And, you know, to Amanda, to your comment of uh, how we need to be holding oil and gas accountable, I have to wonder, are you going to be um, listening to the oil and gas lobbyists that are giving your campaign money? Um, or are you going to be listening to the residents of Northwest Denver? Which brings us to our final question before the lightning round. All right. Chris. Thank you all very much. Uh, last one's going to go to Victoria. That's going to be, that's been a big question as far as the development in District 1, as far as it's going to be community focus or large moneyed interest focus on the newer development in District 1. Victoria, would you tell us about your vision of development in your district and who is, uh, if you're willing to be transparent, we're going to go around to each of the candidates, transparent about uh, where the majority of your campaign money is coming from? Sure. Thank you. I'll start off by saying that I have received zero dollars from any developers or private interest groups um, in the city. And that is because I believe that relationships matter. I believe that putting people over profit is so important enough for me to not take those contributions. Uh, I think that development is good. I think that progress and change is inevitable. I feel that it has to be, and I believe that it has to be responsible. I believe that as people are coming into our neighborhoods and building, that there has to be some type of balance for longtime residents who are already here and who 
have been here for a long time. Uh, I welcome new residents. I've worked my whole life making sure that Denver is a welcoming city for everybody. Uh, and that includes developers, that includes new residents, but I believe that it has to be responsible and it can't leave anybody <coughs> when we talk about development in our district. Um, so I hope that answered the question. Absolutely, rebuttal or concurrence? I would, I'll, I'll say something. So I have not accepted any oil and gas money. Um, I have individual donations. And unlike David Sabados, I have not accepted money from the worst developer in Northwest Denver on the corner of 44th and Tennyson, who personally sued me for doing my job as a council aid. Very personal because my father sold that developer that business right before he died on, with pancreatic cancer. And he said he was going to bring community. He was going to do ground floor activation. And he did not. What he did was he tried to sue Councilman Espinosa and I twice. So <clears throat> I have taken money from small businesses. I have taken money from lawyers. I have taken money from the people of Northwest Denver. But what's really funded my campaign is the ability to have recurring do uh, donations. So on Act Blue, you can set up so you can recur do your donations and you don't always have to remember. It's kind of like having your mortgage payment come out automatically. So a lot of my funders have done automatic recurring donations through Act Blue, which has really helped me at the very end was when I reached out with them at the beginning to be able to set that up. Just for the sake of time, for the rest of the candidates, we want your answer to this question, but we'd love it if you could do it as quickly as possible. Okay, can I jump in on this? Please. You got it. Um, let's see. The developers are a big issue. I did receive a, um, uh, most of my money have come from a variety of sources, the cannabis community, definitely. And as you know, we've been fighting social justice within that community. I've also got a portion of mine from friends, uh, local residents, combination of um, um, people throughout the district. And also I got it from a Metro Housing Coalition who actually sponsored, donated to my campaign because they like my ideas for the future. And that's why, that's why I accepted that because it wasn't a matter of me pushing their agenda, but they like what I like to talk about in terms of sustainable and affordable housing and attainable housing options that I presented to them in my four year plan. So my whole goal is actually, is partnering with people who are going to move your agenda forward, not you moving their agenda forward. Excellent, uh, David. Sure. No, I'm, I'm proud to have uh, championed the campaign finance reform effort last fall, uh, Democracy is the People 2E, um, that bans corporate contributions and creates a public matching fund. Uh, I Last I checked, have more small dollar contributions uh, than any other candidate and more individual contributions. Um, to Amanda accusing me of taking money from the worst of the worst developers, Amanda, I'd love to have a conversation about 44th and Tennyson and how your family uh, made a whole lot of money and how those same developers are fundraising for your campaign. Um, and you have raised more money from developers than every other candidate uh, in this race combined. Now, if that is uh, not a problem for you, that's fine. But before you start throwing mud, you might want to check your own house. Yeah, that's not true, David. So Instead you should keep your back and forth on this topic right now. We'll save that for a later day. Sabrina, did you want to answer this question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think firstly, I'll just say on the on the growth and development, um, we've had a lot of conversations about that at many of the other debates. So I would highly encourage voters who are interested in that to look at the Regis University Forum that we did. It's on their Facebook page and it's fantastic. We answer a lot of those questions. I'm really proud to be running a grassroots campaign with 100% of my contributions coming from individuals and a handful of small local businesses um, with 92% of them coming from our community. So thank you to all of the donors and supporters out there. Um, I'm also very proud to not be taking any money from special interests, political parties, PACs, all of that, because I value my independence and I want to be responsive to the people of Northwest Denver. Um, some of our candidates are getting as much as 85% of their money from out of state. Um, lots of special interests. I encourage people to go on cleanslatenow.org and take a look at our finance reports. And then Mike's the last one. Mike, are you there? Okay, Mike. Yes, sir. Yeah, I am. Uh, unions have been a great supporter of mine. I've been a union member since 1985, and that's what's built America is unions. That's what we've uh, made our finances from. That's what runs the 
wage scale of America, and they've built uh, great buildings, and electricians have made things light up. Uh, so that's uh, where my funding has come from. Uh, but uh, development will continue, but we need to do it in a right and fashionable manner. Thank you, Mike. Um, we're going to go straight over to you. We're going to move into the lightning round. This is the last five minutes of the debate in which the candidates will only answer yes or no to a question. If you need us to reread the question, of course, we'll do that. Uh, there is no place for rebuttal or concurrence to these, so I'm going to start again with Mike. Uh, so here are five questions we're going to throw at you. So first, Denver is unveiling a new transportation department to supersede the RTD in the city, a multi-billion dollar investment, which may free up RTD to properly service the rest of the region. Are you for or against? Yes. Great cities around the world are going green. Denver is home to the nation's most polluted zip code. Science is clear that we're on a short timeline to correct course. Transition Denver to fully renewables by 20 or 30, yes or no? Yes. Denver is voting on legalizing mushroom. The Silobin Initiative, Portugal saw a reduction in drug abuse, uh, drug crime, HIV rates, and more by legalizing drugs and treating it as a health crisis instead of a criminal issue. Colorado is about to pass the billion dollar budget threshold for prisoners, primarily from increases in drug offenses. Should we legalize mushrooms? No. Denver's housing- guys, Can I just clarify, 301 does not legalize mushrooms. It decriminalizes them. It's the, a big difference. Thank you. I just difference. want to throw that out there. Good, good point. Thank you I very much. I just don't much. want people to answer the wrong question. Sorry. Noted. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to make that change right now. Thank you. Number four, Denver's housing problem has only worsened. Uh, other major cities have taken steps to safeguard communities from becoming tourist havens and investment property communities through various methods. State Representative Julie Gonzalez has proposed removing the ban against rent control to allow cities to decide for themselves what works best to support lower income renters. If the ban removal passes, would you support rent control in Denver? Yes. Do you support DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival. Arrivals? Yes. All right, Sabrina? Same five? Same five? Yep. Sabrina. Yeah. From the top, Denver is unveiling a new transportation department to supersede RTD, which may free up RTD to properly service the rest of the region for or against. I'm against the way it's being used, yes, again. Denver is home to the nation's most polluted zip code. Uh, I believe that's District 9 that we just talked about. Science is clear that we're on a short timeline. Do we transition Denver to fully renewables by 2030 or sooner? Yes or no? Yes. yes. The psilocybin initiative, decriminalizing mushrooms. Uh, Portugal saw fantastic results from legalization in general. Uh, do we decriminalize mushrooms, yes or no? Yes. Denver's housing problems are getting worse. Other major cities have taken steps to safeguard renters. State Representative Julie Gonzalez has proposed removing the ban against rent control to allow cities to decide for themselves how best to support low-income renters. If the ban removal passes, do you support rent control in Denver, yes or no? Yes. Do you support DACA? Yes. Amanda, I'm going to abbreviate some of these questions. Uh, freeing up RTD to properly service the rest of the region, yes or no? Yes. Fully renewable energy by 2030, yes or no? Absolutely. Decriminalize mushrooms, yes or no? No. Uh, supporting rent control in Denver, yes or no? Yes. Do you support DACA? Absolutely. David. David. Sir, uh, Denver creating its own transportation system for or against? I don't think we've seen enough information about what the mayor's office has proposed at this point. Is that for or against? <coughs> it's, uh, I don't think we've seen enough information on what the mayor's office has proposed at this point. All right, we're going to mark you as currently against. <laughs> Great cities around the world are going green. Transition Denver to full renewables by 2030 or sooner, yes or no? Absolutely. Psilocybin initiative, do we decriminalize mushrooms, yes or no? <laughs> yes. Denver's housing problems are terrible. Do we support rent control, yes or no? I was proud to stand on the West Steps next to Senator Gonzalez. Do you support DACA? Absolutely. Scott. 
freeing up RTD to properly service the rest of the region? Yes or no? Scott, you might have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me now? There you go. Hello? Yes, sir. Okay, what was the question? I'm sorry. Uh, this is about the uh, Denver um, creating a new transportation department to supersede RTD, uh, which frees up them to properly service the rest of the community. Are you for or against? Yes or no? Uh, uh, for. Going fully yes. renewable by 2030. Yes or no? Yes. Decriminalizing mushrooms. Yes or no? Criminalizing. Yes. Criminalizing or decriminalizing? De decriminalize. Just like cannabis. Absolutely. Uh, would you uh, support rent control in Denver? Yes or no? Yes. Do you support DACA? Yes. All right. And last, Victoria. Victoria, uh, RTD starting its own transportation system. Yes or no? Yes. Uh, City. Starting Denver own. City. Denver City. Yes. That's correct. Uh, transitioning Denver to fully renewables by 2030 or sooner. Yes or no? Yes. Decriminalizing mushrooms, yes or no? Yes. In favor of rent control, yes or no? Absolutely. And do you support DACA? Con todo mi corazón apoyo 100% a DACA. Mm -hmm. We'll take that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sí. Well, thank all of you candidates for uh, taking the time out today to share with our audience. I hope that it's a help everybody to make a better informed decision about the candidate that we wish to represent District 1. This has been the No Bullshit Debate for District 1. This is Chris Ward. And I'm De La Vaca. Before we say goodbye, we're going to ask each of our candidates to give us one minute uh, of a goodbye, of an outro, uh, to wrap up who you are and why District 1 should vote for you. We'll go ahead and start from the top. Let's go, Mike. With Mike. Mike, sir, are you there? Let's move to Amanda Sandoval. Amanda, one minute. Here we go, Mike. Mike here. Oh, oh there. go ahead, Mike. Mike. Mike here. Thirty-four years, I've been a public servant to the city and county of Denver. I was born and raised in North Denver, and I want to see North Denver strive into the new world. So that's why everyone should vote for Mike Soma on May 7th. Thank you, Mike. Sabrina. Hi, thanks. Um, as somebody who has spent my entire career working to engage our community and government, I'm really thrilled to be running with these um, six other amazing individuals who care so very deeply about Northwest Denver. And as I think you heard today, Will, in other forums, we all share similar concerns about our community um, and even have some of uh, the same policy solutions. So as you um, make a decision about who to vote for, I encourage you to consider how rapidly our city is changing and whether or not we really have the luxury of time to train someone new on the job. Uh, consider their service to this community and whether or not they have a track record of building the relationships necessary to get the investments we need for our neighborhoods. We need a representative who's willing to ask hard questions, stand up for our community and demand responsible and affordable growth, and who can also introduce solutions, build those coalitions of support we talked about earlier and negotiate for the investments we deserve in our neighborhoods. If you value experience, if you value collaboration, and if you value results for all of us, I ask for your vote this spring. You can learn more on my website at Sabrina for NWDenver.com. Thanks for having me today. Amanda Sandoval. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm running for you, the residents of Northwest Denver. I'm running for my family and every family that calls Northwest Denver home. I'm running for local area businesses because local businesses are essential to the health of every neighborhood. I'm running for our community because Northwest Denver needs a council person who not only understands the importance of preserving the past, but has the knowledge to successfully advocate for our present and for our future. I'm running because serving in Northwest Denver is in my blood, it's in my heart, and it's in my soul. And being the next council person would be the biggest honor of my entire life. I, my family's been here for, since 1975. We've owned a local business. I've been advocating for the people for the people of Northwest Denver. I've negotiated 19 out of 24 rezonings that have come through in the past four years so that we are not pitting neighbors against neighbors. So when you're thinking about who to 
but cast your vote for, I hope that you cast your vote for Amanda Sandoval. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Again, I'm David Cervedos, um, and I'd be honored to have your vote. Um, I'm proud of the work I've done working uh, with policy at the local level, at the state level, um, and at the federal level with candidates, elected officials, and nonprofit organizations. And as governments become more interconnected, North Denver needs a champion who can be working uh, both with the state and with the federal government, bringing in the resources that we need as well. Um, I think it's important to note, out of 13 current Denver City Council members, um, we have zero renters on Denver City Council at a time where half of the city is renting and we're talking about issues um, of uh, lack of access to affordable housing, um, discrimination uh, against folks uh, seeking homes. Uh, I think you know the half of Denver who uh, is renting instead of owning right now needs a champion and needs a voice on city council as well. Um, and I'd be honored uh, to serve. Thank you. Scott. Here we go. Can you hear me okay? There you go, sir. There you go. I want to be a city council representative for Northwest Denver. I've created a four-year plan that can be viewed on my website at scott, the number four for Denver.com. I am a small business owner. I've been a small business owner most of my life. I am the only one running who has the small business experience, which is needed. I will be the only person sitting on city council with the small business experience that I have, and that is critical. I've also been a resident for 13 years. I've worked with developers already. I've fought them in my neighborhood. I'm already doing the battle for Northwest Denver. I've created over five, over 150 jobs in our district and have over five businesses in our district. This is my home. This is my passion. It's time for me to basically step up, take everything I've known and bring it to the table. I do feel that I'm the most qualified person to run for this office in terms of experience at all levels of business, from property management to owning a dispensary to running a small businesses. And I will fight for you. I'm a United States Marine and I'm a leader. So please vote for me for District 1 and check out my four-year plan. You'll find out everything we're going to do for our district. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Lastly, Victoria. Make sure. Victoria, were you there to say goodbye? Oh, am I here? There you go. Okay, um, thank you for having us. I would just say in closing that I would challenge every single voter in District 1 and throughout the city to dig deep into your core values, who you are as an individual, who we are as a city, and vote based off of those values. Uh, we are at a pivotal time in Denver where we need leaders who are not politicians, who are connected to community, who will go against the status quo, who are bold leaders that are willing to put people first, and that is myself. Uh, I never imagined to run for city council. I'm not a lifelong politician. I wasn't born into a political family. I'm running because I believe in people and because I cannot no longer sit on the sidelines and watch our cities be sold, our community members being displaced, and I hope to gain your support and elect somebody who uh, cares more for people than profit. Well, thank you very much. Again, uh, this concludes our No Bullshit debate. Again, this is Chris Ward. And I'm Dan LaVaca. On behalf of Denver Open Media, KGNU Radio, the Open Media Foundation, and Civic Matters, thank you for hanging out. Think deep, vote wise. We'll see you at the next thank district you for debate. Moderating.